Welcome in, Deep Divers. Today we're diving into something kind of different. We're taking Maslow's hierarchy of needs, mm -hmm. you know, that pyramid from psychology class. Uh, yeah. And we're going to try applying it to entire nations. Okay. You guys sent in some really fascinating stuff on this. And frankly, I'm pretty curious to see what we come up with. Yeah, it's a unique lens to look at things through, isn't it? It really is. I mean, to think that a framework designed for like in individual human motivation right. could actually offer, you know, real insights yeah. into how entire nations behave, how they develop. Yeah. It's, uh, it's pretty intriguing. For sure. You know, we often talk about countries in terms of like, their economies, right? Yeah. Or their military strength. But this, this feels different. Mm. This feels way more, I don't know, fundamental, more human. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's, it's really about understanding that there are these kind of like baseline elements that a nation just can't function without, right. let alone thrive. Right. Okay. So like at the, the very base of Maslow's pyramid, mm. you have those, those very crucial survival needs right like we as humans we need food water shelter all of that yeah but how does that how does that translate to an entire nation what does that even look like well think of it this way just as you know we need food and water to survive right a nation needs energy right energy security exactly access to things like you know oil natural gas and more and more these days renewable energy sources right that's what's keeping the lights on literally literally and figuratively in a lot of ways it's like it's like the difference between trying to like function on an empty stomach versus having a good breakfast yes right without that fuel you're not going to get much done exactly exactly and it goes beyond just energy right yeah. think about um stable agricultural systems oh interesting okay a nation has to be able to feed its people of course if it can't while well, you start to see instability unrest makes sense I mean, history is just full of examples where food shortages led to, you know, massive social and political upheaval. Oh, absolutely. Just look at what's happening right now in in, in insert country experiencing yeah. food insecurity. Right. They've been hit so hard by that drought. Yeah. And it's led to, I mean, widespread protests. The government's teetering on the brink. Yeah. It's a great example of, yeah. of how essential that very, very bottom level of Maslow's pyramid is. Yeah. For a nation to to really just function, uh, to have any chance, yeah, at well being, at stability, exactly. Okay, so that's so that's a big one. Yeah, food security, and then of course there's the, I don't know, maybe it seems like an obvious one, but defensible borders. Yeah, talk about that. Well, it might sound like an old fashioned concept to some people, but yeah. it really speaks to this very fundamental need for security and stability. Yeah, I mean, without it, a nation's just perpetually vulnerable. Right. And it's really hard to make any progress when you're when you're worried about that all the time. Right. Because if you're living in a constant state of fear and instability, mm -hmm. it's pretty much impossible to, you know, focus on building a future or yeah. advancing as a society. Yeah. It's like trying to, you know, build a house on a foundation that just won't stop shifting. It's a great analogy, yeah. You're never gonna feel settled. Exactly, exactly. You're never gonna feel secure. Yeah. And so so if we kind of take this idea of security a step further, mm -hmm. we get to that next tier of Maslow's pyramid, right? Right, right. Where it's not just about, you know, basic survival anymore, but it's about creating order and stability within a nation's own borders. Precisely. And this is where the government really comes into play, right? Okay. Their ability to provide that internal security mm -hmm. to create a stable environment for their citizens. Think about it. Okay. Just like we rely on the police right. and a functioning legal system right. to feel safe in our communities. Of course, right? yeah. Citizens need to have that same trust in their government, that their government can maintain order right. and protect them from threats. Okay, that makes sense. Okay. I mean, it's it's that sense of okay, I can I can relax a little bit, right? Because somebody's somebody's got this. Exactly. Someone's looking out. Exactly. And it's not just like you know about being safe from violence or right. whatever, right? No, no, not at all. It's it's got to be about economic security too, right? Absolutely. Like if people are if they're constantly stressed about money, right? About their jobs, about just like putting food on the table. Yeah, yeah. That creates this this underlying sense of. Anxiety, mm -hmm. and that that can impact an entire society. Absolutely, a stable economy is absolutely fundamental at this level. Mm. It's about a government's ability to create opportunity yeah. for its citizens to build good lives for themselves. You know, yeah, 
Yeah, for sure. To have access to things like education, mm -hmm. healthcare, right. reliable infrastructure. It all matters. These are all critical for a nation to function, for mm -hmm. its people to actually thrive. And to feel, I don't know, I guess hopeful about the future. Yes. Hopeful. That's a great way to put it. Like that if, if I work hard, you know, I can have a decent life. My kids can have a better life. Exactly. And without that, it's really hard to maintain that sense of shared purpose, you know, mm -hmm. that social cohesion. Which brings us to something that I think a lot of people don't really think about. Mm -hmm. Disaster preparedness. Oh, absolutely. That's a big one. Right. Huge. A nation's ability to prepare for and then deal with, you know, like a natural disaster, right. a pandemic, some other kind of huge crisis. Yeah. That's absolutely critical at this level. Okay. It shows that the government, you know, that they're actually capable of protecting their people. Interesting. Yeah. You yeah. know, that they're actually prepared to take care of their citizens when things go really wrong. So give me an example. What does that look like, like in the real world? Well, you look at a country like Japan. They've got earthquakes all the time. Right. So they've invested tons sense. in earthquake resistant infrastructure, early warning systems, all of that. So they're being proactive. Exactly. Or look at the Netherlands. OK. They're basically what? Like below sea level. Right. Their flood management strategies are, I mean, they're light years ahead of most of the world. So they're thinking ahead. Exactly. Yeah. Because they have to. And that comes from a deep understanding of yeah. what it means to to really guarantee national security. It's not just about like having a strong military. No, no, not at all. It's about taking care of your own people. Yes, it's about being prepared for anything. And when a nation doesn't do that, yeah. well, that's when you see that breakdown in trust, you know? Yeah, people start to feel like they're on their own. Exactly, like they're vulnerable, like their leaders don't have their backs. Exactly, and that sense of trust, mm -hmm. that sense of belonging, well, that's essential, right? As we as we move up to that next level of Maslow's pyramid. Exactly, exactly. This idea of social cohesion. Yes. And a shared national identity. This is where we start to go beyond just the physical stuff, you know, right. the economy, security. Right. And we get into these more intangible but incredibly powerful things that that actually bind a nation together. So what are we talking about here? Like what what creates that sense of shared identity? Well, think about the symbols that nations rally around. Okay. Flags, anthems, national holidays. Mm -hmm. These might seem, I don't know, kind of superficial on the surface. Sure, yeah. But they actually play a really important role okay. in creating this sense of, of collective identity, you know? Like we're all in this together. Exactly. We're yeah. all part of something bigger than ourselves. Yes. And those shared experiences, even if they're just, you know, symbolic, they help to create a sense of unity that can help a nation get through really, really tough times. So it's like how like families have their traditions. Yeah. Their own little rituals. Exactly. That maybe maybe an outsider wouldn't even, you know, think twice about. Right. But to them, it's like this is what makes us. Uh, exactly. And on a national level, that kind of unity, it's I mean, it's essential. Yeah. For navigating challenges, mm. for being resilient in the face of adversity. Countries that have that that strong sense of national identity, they tend to weather the storms a lot better. But we're living in a time where, you know, the world is so interconnected. Right. Globalization. People are migrating in ways they never have before. Mm -hmm. There's just, it feels like so much diversity, which is amazing. Right. Of course. But, right. but how do you, how do you hold on to that? It's a challenge. That sense of national unity, that shared identity in a world that feels, I don't know, in some ways like it's spinning faster and faster. You're right. It's a huge challenge. And I think a big part of it is about promoting tolerance. Okay. Understanding between different groups, different cultures, you know. And that takes a real commitment to putting policies in place that are inclusive. So it's about finding that balance. Yes. Between celebrating what makes everyone unique. Mm-hmm while still recognizing those things that we all share. You've got, it's not about erasing differences. Right. It's about saying, okay, you know, we can come from all these different backgrounds. We yeah. can have different traditions, different beliefs. Right. But we're still all part of the same nation and we're all working towards, you know, the same goals. It's about, it's almost like weaving this tapestry, right? Ooh, I like that. Where, where every thread is different. Yeah. But together, yeah, it creates this this beautiful, strong whole. I love that. 
That's a great way to think about it. So, okay. So a nation has, you know, it's got its its foundation in place. Right. Right. It's figured out how to, you know, feed its people. It's got security. Mm. It's built this strong sense of, of national identity. Right. What happens next? Well, just like people, you know, once those basic needs are met, mm. nations start to look outward. Okay. They want to make their mark on the world. Interesting. And that brings us to that next level, the need for international recognition for status. So we've gone from basic survival right. to, you know, a country wanting to like have its moment on the world stage. Exactly. It's a natural progression. That's really interesting. It's almost like that that need to be recognized, you know? Totally. To be respected, to have a voice that matters. Exactly. And for nations, yeah. that can manifest in a lot of different ways. Okay, yeah. so how, so how does that actually play out? Well, you've got some countries that they prioritize economic power, right? Mm. They want to be the top dogs in global trade. Right, right. The leaders in technological innovation. Okay. Others, they might focus more on military strength. Sure, to make sure they're secure. Exactly. Either through, you know, deterrence or building up strong alliances. Right, right. And then there are those that they really go for cultural influence. Interest. Exporting their art, their music, yeah. you know, even their ideas. They want to shape global perception. Soft power. Exactly. Think about like Hollywood. Oh, yeah. I mean, American movies are everywhere, right? For sure. Or K-pop. That's another good example. Well, that's huge. It's massive. And it's a form of cultural diplomacy. You know, it can really change how people see a country. That's really interesting. So it's like sometimes those cultural connections, they can be even more powerful. Oh, absolutely. Than just you know, throwing your weight around. It's um, about building relationships. A hundred percent. It's about fostering these these genuine connections between people. Right, on a human level. Exactly. And then, you know, when a country has that global respect, that admiration, well, they can actually leverage that okay. to support causes they believe in. Interesting. Give me an example. Well, they might become a champion for human rights, promote democracy around the world, or even, you know, take the lead in addressing these these huge global challenges. Like climate change. Exactly. Or global poverty, things like that. So we're talking about a nation that's that's not just looking out for number one. Right. But is actually trying to to make the world a better place. Precisely. And that brings us to that that top tier of Maslow's pyramid. Self-actualization. Yes. And that's a tough one, right? It is. Because when we talk about self-actualization for, you know, an individual, mm -hmm. we're talking about fulfilling your potential. Right. Finding your purpose. Yeah. Living a meaningful life. What does that even mean for an entire nation? It's a really interesting question. And I think if you consider a nation that's reached you know, self-actualization. Hmm. It suggests that they're focused on something much bigger than themselves. Okay. So it's about more than just, you know, being the best or the richest. Yeah. It goes beyond survival, beyond security, even beyond status. So then what is it? What are we left with? I think it's about using your, your strengths, mm -hmm. your resources, your influence to make a real difference in the world. Wow. So instead of just asking what's in it for me, right. it's about asking how can I contribute? Yeah. How can I help? Exactly. Think about a country that's that's really prosperous right. economically, socially. They could easily just focus on maintaining that, right? Sure. Just enjoy their own success. Yeah, it's the easy path. Right. But what if they used all of that, all of their advantages to actually lift other nations up? Okay. Promote peace, encourage cooperation, invest in solutions to problems that, that affect everybody. It's a really different way of, I don't know, of... Thinking about a nation's role in the world. It is. It's inspiring. Actually. It is inspiring because at the end of the day, a nation, it's not that different from a person. You know, point. it's not just about how much money you have or how strong you are. It's about what you do with it. Exactly. It's about your values. It's about your actions. It's about the mark you leave on the world. It's about the legacy you leave behind. Yes. And that is something worth thinking about. It really is. Well, deep divers, I hope you've enjoyed this little thought experiment as much as we have. Applying Maslow's hierarchy of needs to entire nations. It's not a perfect system, but it really gives you something to chew on. It does. It reminds us that we're all connected and that the choices we make, they have these ripple effects all over the world. 100%. So keep asking those tough questions. Keep exploring those big ideas, and we'll catch you on our next deep dive.